Unicorn Overlord, True Zenoiran Sword Tier List. Let's jump into it. Okay, so we have S tier through D tier. S tier are OP unique swords that there's either a few of them, they have insane stats, they open themselves up to huge strats, or they have unique things about them that set them apart. So things that give huge stats, things that give action and passive points and other good stats, or just they have a really good attack. Uh, A tier, these are almost always good to use. They have things that set them apart from the other swords, but they're not necessarily as unique or good as the S tiers. They're always good to run, like they're always uh, like better than most things, and typically they should be used if there are no S tier swords available. Uh, B tier, these are just generally good to use. These are like your basic swords that fulfill most roles that most classes can use well. Uh, C tier, these can be like swords that you use early that get upgraded into better things later on. They're just decent. They don't really make it into the end game, I would say. And then D tier are swords you want to get rid of as soon as humanly possible. So to begin with, let's, start, let's talk about the bronze sword. This is the starter sword. It's serviceable for the first like couple of battles you have it in, but you really want to replace it with something immediately. It has the lowest stats and no positive attributes in relation to other swords. So it's basically just outclassed by their things and you want to drop it as soon as possible. Uh, and then next we have the Recruit's Short Sword. I would say this is also similar. It's very weak. The HP and the XP are nice, but really beyond like the first four to five battles, you really shouldn't be running these. You should, you should be trying to get rid of as much junk as possible. And these are just like one of those items that the XP gain is negligible and the health is nice, but it's, it's only slightly better than the bronze sword here. All right, and then we have the Baroque sword. This, I would say, is probably one of the first, like, okay weapons you get. It's a little bit more might than the recruits, and it also has hit plus five, which is very valuable. There's a lot of things that have high dodge rates in this game, and there's a lot of sword classes that simply have low hit rates or no true strike. So getting hit plus five on swords is a pretty big deal early game. Now, the things that want to be killed with True Strike still want to be killed with True Strike, but at least this gives you something to try to deal with those. Uh, and then we have the Iron Sword. I would say this is like a side grade to the Baroque, where it has a little bit more might, but it has less hit. So it's kind of just like a slight side grade for damage, but it loses hit rate. And then we have the Black Iron Sword. I would say this is just better than both of them. It's still in C tier, but it's, cer it's certainly better than both. 17 physical attack. This is like the first decent damage sword you get outside of like runic blade uh, It has crit plus five so it does help crit builds slightly But it's still not enough to really justify running it long term. There's definitely better options if you're thinking about forging uh, But it's decent and then we have great wood sword. This is really only good on elven fencers other things They can kind of use it like magical units or units like uh, sainted knights or units with like as good physical attack as magical attack can use this, but typically you want to use this on units who either have a magical attack, which very few things do, like a magical melee. So basically it's only really good on Elven Fencer, and even then I think it's just like decent. It's it's not the best thing, there's definitely better things to run. Its stats are fine, uh, magic defense plus three is okay, but it just gets outclassed by other things, you want to get rid of it as soon as possible. Uh, Alright, Karnat Sword. This is also a pretty decent one, I think. Uh, initiative plus 2 and physical attack 19. So now we're starting to climb physical attack. I actually think this is like almost B tier. I want to say it's B tier, but whenever I have the option to, I almost never use it. And there's there's a reason for that. I would say it's like high C. I, like these, as C tier fills out, these will start to be pushed down, but I think it's decent. It has good attack, and initiative plus 2 is objectively good. But I think there's just better things that fill more niche roles versus this. All right, and then the next thing, Steel Sword. So this is where we start getting into just like big damage from like basic weapons. I would say this thing is like B. It has like decent stats. It's damage, it's like low B though. It has just attack. And in this game, hitting like plus 20, like 20 or higher attack is pretty valuable. Uh, now you could argue Carnet belongs in low B with it, but I think it's like high C, low B. They're both kind of similar. Uh, I think it's just fine. Uh, then let's see. 
to navigate through this. Here we go. Spell Steel Sword. So this is just better than this, stat-wise. It just has a little bit higher stats. I'm gonna put this in uh, low B as well. It's a little bit better than the Great Wood Sword. It has just better stats in both ways. So it's if you're an Elvish Fencer, you just one upgrade to this immediately. It just has better stats. Now it doesn't have the Magic Defense, but Magic Defense on those classes, they're evasion tanks, they tend not to get hit anyways. It, it's like a meme, it doesn't matter. Uh, so that's that. A Vorpal Sword, now we're talking. This is where we start getting into Good. This is a good B tier sword. This is like the definition of like a solid B tier sword. Let's put it higher. So HP plus five, initiative plus three, 20. So it's almost max physical attack. And it also gives you a little bit of bulk and plus three initiative is really the reason to use this. The reason to use this is a little bit of bulk, but mainly the initiative plus three and it has 23 attack. This is a fantastic filler sword or until you get something better. But it has really good stats, and you could run this on a unit and it'd be fine. Alright, next we have the Dragonbone Blade. Now, Dragonbone weapons typically are valuable on units who don't care about initiative. So it's good on support units that don't need to act soon anyways. So this weapon on a sword unit, which is something that needs to attack, does hurt it a lot. And I honestly don't think it's very good. I'm putting it in C tier. Passive point plus one is valuable, but the fact that you have to throw out 10 initiative and it's only 15 attack kind of makes it not worth using. I really like dragon bone weapons on like shield units who are already super slow so that they can cover and it doesn't matter, or staff units who just support anyways and use like passive points primarily. But on like an active, like on, on an active sword fighter, or not the sword fighter, on an active sword unit, I don't want to kill their initiative this much. This is just too big of a cost. Uh, Vorpal Sword, we did. Alright, Thorn Blade. So, Thorn Blade. HP minus 15, passive point plus 1, 17 physical attack. I think this is similar. I just can't justify... It's definitely better than these, because these both give passive points. I think the cost of both of these is just too steep to justify the passive point, and the damage is kind of bad, so it's like... This is like a middle game plus weapon, so it's not like you get this early. You get an Elven Land, so you're like halfway through the game. So HP minus 15 is a pretty big cost. You're just opening yourself up to getting killed by like arrow assist or like range assist, uh, magic assist, and enemy tower abilities, which is like a serious problem in this game. Uh, if you want to play like quickly, those are like the main things that get in your way. Or if you want to just beat maps. Uh, all right, so let's do Icefall Blade. So this one, this one's not bad. If you're in a class that doesn't care about blocking, Guard rate minus 20% is not a downside at all, especially if you're on a class that literally is an evasion tank that doesn't block. Uh, base passive point plus one, physical attack 19. I would say this is like low B tier. I don't really use these because there's better options around the time you get them, but they're serviceable. You get passive point plus one if you don't guard anyways, it's just a good sword. So it's just better than the other two options, which one kills your durability, which is painful. The other one kills your initiative. It's just not worth it. Uh, Wingcrest Blade. This thing I think actually is A tier. I think this is our first A tier. Crit minus 20% does not matter if you are using guaranteed crits, if the unit doesn't need to crit anyways, and that's it really. <laughs> if you're if you're going for like 30 to 50% crit rates or something, this obviously hurts, but in most cases, uh, plus one passive point and 21 physical attack on units that don't care about critting, which there are a lot of units who don't, is a pretty solid option and the damage is there it's it's basically one of the better passive point things in terms of just like raw stats and there are ways to get around the crit rate thing so it's not like a death sentence if you're still trying to crit uh, but typically you would run this on something with like sniper amber lens until you get a better sword i would say it's a good i mean does that make it b tier though maybe maybe i guess we'll bump down to high b tier let's <laughs> it's not it's clearly not that good. Decent. All right, Templar Sword. Uh, physical defense plus one, guard rate plus 5%. I would say this is just like a high C tier. It's it's damage is too low to use long term. If you were to forge it, guard rate plus 5% is decent. You could use it for the guard rate. By the time you can forge though, I would argue guard rate is not something that matters really. So it's just not a good stat. Uh, it's, it's stats are just fine. 
Uh, and then we have Zenoiran Sword. This is from the Black Market. HP plus 10, physical, magical defense plus 2, 14 attack. This is like a good... A lot of C tiers. <laughs> this is like a good filler sword for until you get something better just to make a unit more tanky. Especially if you want to throw it on a thief who's getting one shot by things. This can allow them to tank a hit and improve their damage a little bit in like the early game. But beyond that, I actually don't recommend getting this in the black market. I think they're kind of a waste of money. Uh, but they can be nice if you really want the durability. Uh, Phantom Knight Sword. So this gives Phantom Attack 16 magic plus 5 magic defense. Phantom Attack, attack a single enemy for 120 magic potency and inflicts passive point minus one. So this sword, I think this sword is just bad Runic Blade, honestly. It's Runic Blade, but it lacks like the flexibility to hit physical or magical. And it kind of, it's really weird because if you use this on a unit who has like physical potency attacks, it doesn't give you any physical attack bonus at all. So it kind of just hurts those classes and I just don't think it's very good. Honestly, I'm gonna put this in D tier. <laughs> I don't think it's worth it at all. It's, I mean, I guess maybe in some niche circumstances, but it just seems like it's bad. All right, then we have the Zenoiran Knight Sword. So this is the Zenoiran Sword, but just like beefed up. It has better physical damage. It has uh, HP plus 15, physical and magical defense plus four. This one I think is low A tier. This you could use in endgame. It gives you good defensive stats and its damage is respectable. So you can use this on most matchups and it's fine. It's like a really good filler sword that's... You can use this on... Like, you can use this on a dude in, like, an actual team. You, like, for your endgame team. Assuming that all the other swords are taken. Like, all the S-tier swords. It's very serviceable, very good. Heaven Swing. Alright, now this one's forged. It usually has 16 attack. Accuracy plus 10, evasion plus 10. I think this is S tier. This is crazy. Getting accuracy and evasion, and then also if you forge it, it, like, you know, it has, this has good enough stats to justify forging it, I think. I think this is one of the few swords that you can take from the early game. All right, so here, here are all the good things about this sword. First of all, it's an early game sword. As soon as you get Oclis, you get this. This thing allows you to stack evasion so that your units uh, who are evasion tanks on swords, basically just can't get hit. So it allows you to stack evasion, it also gives you accuracy, which is very valuable for fighting other things at dodge, and its base might of 16 is really good in early and middle game, and then later on as you go, you can still use it, and it's still like serviceable, but once you forge it, it just becomes, it like kind of falls off in Bastorius damage-wise, only slightly, it's only just like a few points of damage behind other things. So depending on who, who's using this, it's still good. But then once you hit like Angel Lands and you forge it, and like then you take it in Endgame, it's it's just a really good sword in Angel Lands and Endgame. It only really falls off. Like in Elheim, I think it's fine. It only kind of falls off by like a few points of damage relative to other swords. And I'm talking like three to five points of damage. It's not even like a significant amount. I think this thing never is really bad. Uh, you could argue it's only bad in Bastorius, but in Angel Lands, it's fine. You can get to the Forge relatively quickly if you know what you're doing. Uh, and then once you forge it, it's just like one of the better swords in the game. Now, there is something better than it, obviously, that's also an S tier that we'll get to, but I think it's pretty strong. All right, Hunter's Claymore. This thing is an obvious S tier as well. I think it's a little bit better. 22 Might, follow-up skills. Now, the, the plus 20 damage is actually plus 20%. So it's not plus 20 flat damage. It's like a translation issue. Uh, so plus 20% more damage. So if it says potency for a follow-up, uh, 75, you get potency 95. So it's still significant. And crit rate plus 10. You don't even need to forge this, and it's really good. You can forge it for the extra 3 damage, but it, you typically don't need it. You get most of the damage from the follow-up skills damage bonus. And there's also a Hunter's Buckler that does the exact same thing, gives, except it gives crit plus 5 and follow-up skill damage plus 20. So if you run both of those on a wide pursuit build, you're looking at plus 40% damage on all of your pursuits, which adds up to 115% base potency, which is pretty huge damage, and it also has plus 15 crit between the two of them. These, this thing is just always good to use. All right, then we have Hallowed Blade. Uh, heal plus 10% when using active skill, max HP plus five. This, I think, actually, you, you could justify running this for... I would say it's like A tier, like low A tier. You could justify forging this. 
Deal plus 10% is very valuable. It's just good for dealing with like enemy spam, like range assists, magic assists, uh, enemy AoE attacks that they use on the board, uh, like arrow rain and blaze and things that just deal chip damage just to like heal up. Uh, now, if you're running a super optimal team, things like this aren't the best, but you can still run this if you're just playing the game in kind of like a chill way. Uh, Hunter's Spirit, sorry. Meteorite Sword. All right, here's where <laughs> things start getting insane. Uh, so this you get from Bastorius. Uh, HP plus 20, 24 attack, guard rate plus 10%. I would say this is like here. I think it's a little bit worse than this. But HP plus 20 gives you bulk, guard rate plus 10% is fantastic on shield units. It's just a good sword. It has good stats. It's easy to get, relatively speaking. Uh, it's more of like an endgame thing, but you can run it and it's totally fine. Getting bulk on a lot of these endgame classes seriously matters because that can be the difference between dying from a thing or not, like a single hit or not. Or, you know, just dying from an arrow rain, which is obnoxious, but they're in the game, so you gotta deal with it. Alright, Carnelian Blade. Hmm, so you get one of these from... I think you only can get one. You get it from the Colosseum. Now, obviously, the physical attack is decent, and base AP plus one is really good. I would say it's a little... I honestly think it's a little bit worse than Heaven's Swing. Heaven's Swing? Heaven's Swing or Heaven's Wing? Heaven's Swing. I think it's a little bit worse because accuracy and evasion are a little bit more important than action points in late game, especially once you get a ton of, like, ruby uh, pendants and things like this. I find myself never using this on my endgame builds, and it's not because I'm like consciously avoiding it or something, it's just that it doesn't solve problems that builds typically have. It can be used though, you can't, like it is, it still is AP plus one and good damage, so I, I still think it belongs in S tier, but I would actually rather use the, um, the meteorite sword in most cases, because it has more damage, it gives you health, and it gives you guard rate, so it just makes something super tanky. Uh, but you could you could argue they're like side grades, I would say. All right, meteorites. Okay, scorpion sting. So this one gives poison immunity, twenty one attack, grizzly poison. Attack a single enemy and inflicts poison. So one hundred fifty potency, single target hit, plus fifty potency and crit versus poison target. So if you're running some kind of like poison staff build, or a build that like poisons a lot. This allows any unit to have a 200 potency guaranteed crit attack. This is actually kind of interesting. Uh, single target stuff, you can you can beat the game with single target stuff, and you can make teams that demolish with single target stuff, so I don't want to say this is bad. Uh, just for its stats, 21 and poison immunity, I think it belongs in A tier. I'll put it like here. I think it's still strong, like even if you just use this for stats and poison immunity, that's valuable. That's still valuable. Uh, Viper's Fang. Uh, poison slash 12 physical attack attack a single enemy inflict poison this is more of like an early game weapon that falls off hard i think i don't think there's any real reason to continue running this beyond early game i'm gonna put this in like high c tier i think that's fair uh searing rapier rapier fire slash attack a single enemy inflict burn I think this is similar. I don't think this is very valuable. I don't really like it. I never run these. When I've used them in early game, I feel like Runic is usually better or something else is better than either of them because you can kill so fast that conditions never, almost never matter. Maybe against Galarius or something, but if every other fight it doesn't matter, then it's not that good. <laughs> All right, Flame Burge. So another, like similar to the other one, 21 attack, burn immunity, grizzly fire. Attack a single enemy, inflicts burn, 150 physical potency. It does cost 2 AP, but also plus 50 potency and guaranteed crit versus burning. So this, I would say, is similar. It's it's a burn immunity, like worst case scenario, it is a burn immunity 21 might sword. And you can also combo off of burn for 200 potency and crit. That's actually a lot of damage. A guaranteed crit with 200 potency is actually a significant amount of damage. And if you use like a fire curse staff and then like grizzly fire or something, it's probably going to die. I'm going to guess. <laughs> Unless the, the unit in question is very weak, but that's decent damage. All right, and then we have Barbarian's Might, max HP plus 5, physical attack 14, provoking slash, uh, 75 potency, attacks a single enemy, forces the targets uh, to focus attacks on the user. Now this is like ideally used on tanks, but tanks are slow 
So you can use this on like an angel or something and force a thing to fight it, but like the things that are really a threat in this game are true strikes, enemy flyers, uh, row attacks, and stuff like this. So like provoking slash and barbarian's bites I think are just like, I think it's bad. I think it's worse than like these weapons. It actually can't be, right? It's a little bit better than these. I think it's like here. It's like somewhere in C tier. All right, Dancer's Delight. So crit plus 10, 16 physical attack, leaping slash. Uh, 100 potency, 100 hit, attack a single enemy, grants the user plus one AP if the attack is critical. And then you lose crit rate every time you do this. So this one's weird because you get negative crit rate from using it and there are builds that allow you to keep critting and then refreshing action points, but it's a slow weapon. So typically the way I like to build teams is I like to have column attacks, row attacks, board attacks. Those are the fastest attacks, like the in terms of hitting as many things and killing as many things. And single hit kills can be good if you're cleaning up row and column attacks. But if you're not cleaning up row and column attacks and your main strategy is to use something like this, you're actually suffering because you're just playing slower and you're allowing the enemy to get more attacks off, which in the end, can allow them to kill your units and slow you down more. So typically something like this I would say isn't good, but at the very least it's 16 physical attack and crit plus 10, you can completely ignore leaping slash. Uh, so for those reasons I would put it in like high C tier just for its stats. Alright, and then we have Crimson EP, uh, 16, or I'm sorry, 14 physical attack, 3 initiative, active shatter, attack a single enemy, inflicts AP minus 1. Honestly, they're just better options, but in it, plus 3 and 14 physical attack. It's almost in B tier, but honestly, I think it's like here. Alright, Sylph's Bane. Evasion plus 10, 16 physical attack, Sonic Blast. Uh, attack a single enemy, turn into Knuckles, no, I'm just kidding, <laughs> turn into Tails. Plus 80 potency versus flying, so 150 versus flying, it's considered a range. So this allows a sword unit to attack backliners, and it also gives them something that counteracts flying enemies' evasion for the most part, where they get double evasion versus grounded melee, but ranged attacks bypass that, so they're, you're just hitting with like a more, like less punished hit rate, but you can still, they can still dodge it. Uh, but evasion plus 10, 16 physical attack. If you forge this thing, just having another evasion plus 10, I think is valuable. I'm gonna put this in B tier. This like here. I think this has potential. Evasion plus 10 is a good passive. And the Sonic Blast is okay utility for when you need it. But beyond that, probably just mostly using it for the stats. All right, Hailstorm Edge. Physical attack 20. This one is another one that's just good for stats. Physical attack 20, accuracy plus 20, that's the equivalent of having blue spectacles for free. Freeze immunity. Those are good effects, actually. Those add up to decent effects. And then Icicle Dart, uh, this is a hybrid attack. Attack a single enemy, inflicts freeze. It's also a true hit. This is not bad. You get a true hit, so you have good stats, you have accuracy. Honestly, I think this deserves a spot in like low A tier. Just for accuracy, plus 20, freeze immunity, and physical attack 20. Those are just good stats. And then also you get a true hit that has 150 potency that freezes. It costs you two active points, but you're mostly going to be using this for the hit plus 20, which is very valuable because swords, if you're not on certain classes, if you're not like a sword master, you don't really have access to true hit outside of uh, gear that gives you true hit. So hit plus 20 and then a true hit is kind of nice for swords. All right, and then we have... Gale Cutter. This one, honestly, I think I've been underestimating this. Evasion 20 is very, very strong in this game. Physical attack, just for stats, physical attack 22, evasion 20 is very good, but you also get double blast. Uh, attacks two enemies, so this is the only sword in the game that gives you an AoE attack, so very, very few sword units have like big AoEs. Most sword attacks are single hit. So this is like the only sword in the game that gives you a multi-hit outside of classes that have multi-hit with swords. Attack two enemies, uh, plus 80 potency versus flying. So it's basically like the Sonic Blast, but it hits two things. And then it also has, you know, range, so it can target backliners. So you're looking at like decent damage, like chip damage, and then good damage versus flyers. And then of course, evasion 20. 
Honestly, just for evasion 20, I'm putting this in like high, like mid S, I would say. And it's already almost fully, like, you don't even need to forge it. Like, three damage, who cares? Evasion 20 and 22 physical attack is fantastic. That's really good on, like, an angel or something. Or whatever you want. It's good on anything. That's just, like, passive damage reduction. All right, Pursuance Blade. So 20 attack, so that's decent. But you also get Pursuit for free. So this is kind of nice. Now, it's just a basic Pursuit. It's not like Liberator's Pursuit, which strips buffs. Or Wide Pursuit, which does a row attack but it's decent it's 70 it's the basic pursuit with decent stats i'll put it in like high b tier i think that's fair cutthroat's boon evasion plus 10 blindness immunity <laughs> blindness immunity <laughs> why is that important those angels that blind you this hard counters them and evasion plus 10 that's pretty nice now the attack, Assassin's Nail, attack a single enemy, inflict blindness, plus 50 potency and critical hit at nighttime. This is interesting, uh, so 150 potency and then guaranteed crit at night. It's interesting, but you're mostly just using this for blindness immunity and its stats and the evasion. These are just good stats. Alright, next we have Sanguine Blade, Sanguine Attack, attack a single enemy, 100 potency, recover 50% of damage dealt. Uh, 16 physical attack. Honestly, I feel like this is like an early game thing you can use for fun, but later on you're gonna have things healing you in your team comps, or your team comps are bad. <laughs> if, you're, if your team, like, any team comp can just take like a large aid kit, doesn't matter what it is, and have someone heal the party afterwards. So as long as you have some kind of form of healing, this is just a redundant weapon that falls off. So I would say it's just like here. All right, then we have Moonlight Repair, Nocturnal Strike. So just the stats on it are fine. I think you get this in Angel Lands, though, so that factors in. At the start of battle, attack a single enemy with the first strike, grants the user plus one passive point at night. Um, honestly, I don't think this is good. For late game, this is a terrible at the start of battle effect. Uh, there are at the start of battles that just give you, like, initiative plus 20 to your entire team. Uh, row attacks that do really big damage. There's like so many good at the start of battle effects. This is just not it uh, For endgame. It also has no other stats aside from just damage. So I would say this is like a C tier endgame weapon All right, and then we have runic sword. So runic sword now that's normal stats I think are 8 14. I want to say physical attack 8 magic attack 14. I'm fairly certain that's right If it if it isn't let me know, but this is what have this is what it looks like when you forge it Magical defense plus three decent base stats now this thing I don't think ever falls off and if you forge it it just gets better Magical potency 150 attack for a single hit. This is really good on sainted knights It allows them to take their high magic attack It gives them 150 potency attack which the highest a sainted knight can get to I think it's just a hundred and they have like a dual hit That's pretty weak that needs you to be at like max HP to gain like passive points or something but this allows them to just kill enemy armor, and other classes can use this as well. Uh, hybrid classes can use this. So if you run this on Elven Fencer, you can actually kill with this. I ran a build and I demoed it, then they can magic attack as needed. Now, they don't need the magic attack, but it's a decent weapon. Now, is this S tier? Honestly, I think you could argue it never falls off. I'll put this in high A tier. I'll put it in high A tier. I think on magical classes it's really good, but there are physical classes that are just better, and evasion is generally better for avoiding taking damage. You could argue it's S. Actually, I think it's, honestly, I think it's better than this. It's like here. I think it is better than this. AP plus one is good, but this is really valuable. The way that it, it's valuable is different. It's not used, first of all, it's not used on physical attackers. So it's not gonna be, you would not run the uh Zenoy or what's the Zenoy run? What's that thing called? <laughs> Let me pull up my little thing here. If I can. Let's not do that. Uh, let's see. Can't remember the name of all these things, dude. Swords, here we go. Carnelian, sorry. I don't know why I forgot that. Carnelian sword. Yeah, so the Carnelian sword is used on physical attackers. It's decent, but it doesn't do anything for magical units, so if you use this on like a Sainted Knight or an Elvish Fencer, 
or any other hybrid class. I don't really think there really are any, many, many other beyond that. But really just Sainted Knight attack. Like, Sainted Knight can heal really well, and this just gives a damage option if your team is not killing for whatever reason. Uh, but it never falls off, and it's fantastic early game. It allows, like, Elaine and other units to use Sword to kill armors early, which is a, a serious problem. And these units have high initiative, unlike mages, so they don't have to worry about things like attack speed and stuff like this. Uh, or, like, low initiative, rather, because, like, the things that can kill armors typically have low initiative, like the mages. And they also die to, like, spam easier, so... I think it's pretty decent. I think it's, like, a low S tier. Wyvern's Razor. This, you could argue, is also S tier if you forge it. Crit damage, plus 20. Crit rate, plus 10. Base might of 14. And you get these fairly early, too. If you forge this thing, I think it's an S tier. Forging. Like, probably, like, here. Because it has a place in the metagame. The metagame right now is, like, using Amber Lens. And so you could run this on, like, a lane and give him more crit damage. And the crit rate doesn't matter, but the crit damage is huge value. So... If you Gambler coin him and he Amber Lenses, which gives you True Strike and Crit, and he does his uh, Beyblade Row Attack, you're looking at plus 50% crit damage from the Gambler coin and plus 20% more from this. And it might be overkill, so it actually might just be like A tier, honestly. Let's put it like here. It might, it might just be overkill for that build. But it's still pretty good, it's good stats. All right, Rose Knight Sword. Accuracy plus 10, initiative plus 3, and decent stats otherwise. Uh, should you forge this? Maybe. It's decent. I don't think it's, like, the best thing. I would say it's, like, here, maybe here. I'll put it in low B tier. It hit fixes. It gives you 3 in hit. It's decent. Stingray. Plus 15% crits, poison immunity. Now, this can only really be used on sword masters, right? Like, these fencing things. Oh, actually, hold on. Can Elaine even use that sword? I haven't even checked that. Wyvern's Razor. Can he even use this? If he can't, that bumps it down. I feel like he can. It might be a repair, and he might not be able to use it because it's a repair. Let's put it in low A tier in, that, in case. <laughs> but then it gets bumped down if that's the case. Alright, Stingray. Crit rate plus 15, poison immunity, uh, arts and strike. Activates the start of battle, attack of foes, true strike. I think this thing falls off. I think there's just better options. Crit rate plus 15 is decent. I think this is a sword master only thing, so it makes it kind of bad. I'm pretty sure. If not, you can correct me. Uh, if it isn't sword master only, crit rate 15 is decent. Poison immunity is whatever. Um, the stats, the stat, the base stats are too bad to justify using this long term. And, and even if you forge it, crit rate 15 is really the reason you'd run it. Uh, Alright, Bandit's Longsword. Init's- this one is actually kind of crazy how good this is. Initiative plus 3, Evasion plus 10, Users units- Users unit earns plus 100% gold. So the reason why this is nice is you get it pretty early, and it also just gives you more initiative and evasion. So, if you forge this thing... Uh, do you need gold that much? Not really. Gold is never scarce in this game unless you're intentionally wasting your money. I found, after doing... Uh, three Trues and Oiren runs. Like, you really have to go out of your way to waste money on bad items for gold to ever be an issue. But for the evasion, the initiative, I would say it's, like, here. You can forge it if you want to. Maybe it's, like, high, high B. Let's move some things around. Let's assume... I don't know if, you, if Elaine can use this or not. <laughs> Uh, from memory, I'm pretty sure he can, but I can't say for certain. Alright, Royal Saber. Initiative plus 5. So this, just, uh, this is just a good initiative fix. And it has decent stats, and you get it pretty early. I would say this is, like, here. It's just good. It just has good stats. It's really good for utility units. Well, actually, maybe it's not. Maybe it's, like, high A. Because it's really good on the Prince. The Prince doesn't care about damage, so you don't forge it. He just cares about initiative, so he can... Uh, offensive order of the team. So I think it's just good for that. Uh, and then we have King's Blade Cornix. Uh, arguably, this is one of the best weapons in the game. So all stats, so you, it's 15 base physical. You get it super early. All stats plus 5 basically makes it 20 attack. <laughs> so it, 
it never is bad. It's always good damage wise, but you get five hit, five initiative, five crit, five evasion, five block, five magic. You get literally five, five health, you get five everything. This is just like one of the best swords in the game. Uh, I do think it's, well, we'll see. We'll see what I think. <laughs> All right, great sword. So this is Amalia's weapon. It's just a max damage sword that you can get relatively early if you unlock her early, which can be easily achieved because you can cheese the arena quite easily. So where does this belong? So max damage sword, I would say it's like high A tier. It's just a max damage sword you can get early. And it's, it does get replaced by better things, but it doesn't fall off for a while because you don't get max damage swords until like angel lands or forging. So pretty valuable weapon. All right, then we have Noto's sword. This is why I was hesitant to say the one sword was the best damage. There's like two. Well, these next ones are all insane. So base AP plus one, initiative plus 10, evasion plus 10. Honestly, I think this is a little bit better than King's Blade Cornix. It gives you five more initiative and it gives you action point. That's pretty huge value. And it gives you evasion. It does it does all the things you want. Like evasion for dodging stupid spam and crap, like range assist, magic assist spam, and then initiative for attacking er earlier, and then of course the action point, and it's max damage, so it does not need forage, and you cannot forage it. Uh, its availability is obviously late game, but it's just really strong. So it's definitely one of the better swords in the game. All right, a Rosalera sword. Base passive points plus one, HP recovery plus 30. So that's HP recovery is like when you get healed and stuff, you just get healed for more. Uh, or if some healing thing affects you, you just get healed for more. It's a, So it's a max damage base passive point plus one sword, HP recovery plus 30. Now it's not as aggressive as some of these other swords, but it's very good on utility units. Uh, it's actually really good on like a Sainted Knight that's not trying to attack at all because it just allows it to get more passive points and it makes its healing better. Uh, but where would I put it? I would say like here. Like there is fine. It's still an S tier, but I think it's a little bit worse than evasion plus 20 near max damage sword because evasion 20 is huge for tanking. All right, and then we have the whole unicorn blade. Actually, no, hold on, now that I think about it, <laughs> the Holy Unicorn Blade, even if Elaine can use this. Put this here. The Holy Unicorn Blade is the reason why you wouldn't want to. This, I think, has to be the best sword in the game. Now, only Elaine can use this, but just look at the stats on this. First of all, it has the highest damage of any weapon possible. 28 physical attack. Passive point, active point, plus one, debuff immunity. <laughs> this is the best sword in the game, for sure. It's not even close. It does everything, and it has the best stats. It does everything in terms of, like, giving you resources to do things and denying debuffs completely, so this has to be the best sword. And it's on a unit who can hard carry and just completely delete rows of enemies. So it's pretty overpowered, honestly. <laughs> All right, and then the... Sacral sword. Affliction immunity. So afflictions are different from debuffs. Afflictions are considered debuffs, by the way, but not all debuffs are considered afflictions. Uh, it sounds confusing, but basically it's like this. Afflictions are like status effects, like burn, uh, poison, paralyze, freeze, and so on. And debuffs could be like the enemy does less damage. Like shaman can, uh, can apply a debuff, for example, to reduce enemy attack. So this does not give you immunity to shaman things, whereas the unicorn sword does. This gives you immunity to things like burn, poison, stun, and so on. So it's still extremely valuable. Affliction immunity, heal 20% when using active skill. So honestly, like, it is really strong. I would say it's like here, or not here, sorry. Do I think it's better? It's definitely in the top four. Do I think it's better or worse than King's Blade? So King's Blade gives you more damage, evasion, more crit, guard rate, initiative. I think they're almost similar. Maybe it's, I think they're like similar. You could argue it's better because it has max damage immediately. It doesn't need forged, but you don't get it until much later. But I do think it's S tier. I think it's an obvious S tier. So, of all these swords, I think the Unicorn Holy Blade is the best for sure. And the rest of these, I think it's kind of obvious why they're good. 
Uh, na na or nation. <laughs> Initiative and evasion plus 10. It's huge. Uh, all stats plus 5 is massive, especially when it's forged. Uh, the evasion plus 10, hit plus 10 is really nice on this. Evasion plus 20 is nice on this. There's just, there's a lot of really good swords that I think fit into the metagame. Uh, let me talk about the channel members thing. There you go. Alright, so here's the tier list. Let me know if you agree or disagree and why. Uh, this is for True Zenoiren. I'm assuming that you're playing, like, not necessarily super fast, but you're trying to beat maps relatively quickly because there's a time limit and you're running classes that are mostly optimal. And some of these are just, like, bad weapons that just fall off, I think. Oh yeah, that's it for this one. Definitely like and subscribe if you enjoyed this round that's useful, and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.